And now, it's Boomer Life, lifestyle discussion designed to make your life more engaging, meaningful, and complete. Celebrating the baby boomer generation, this is Boomer Life on Sea Isle 650. Well, good morning and welcome to Boomer Life here on Sea Isle 650. It's a week away from Valentine's. We're already into February heart and stroke month, and that will be the focus of today's episode of Boomer Life. We're going to talk about the many cardiac options available at False Creek Health Care Center, along with executive health programs and all sorts of other services that they are able to provide. We are joined in studio by two doctors from False Creek Health Care Center in Vancouver. Vancouver. Dr. Lauren Feynman is the medical director of the Urgent Care Center, Family Practice, Executive Health, and Women's Wellness Program. She received her training at the University of Alberta Hospital in Edmonton. Dr. Feynman, welcome to the program. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Sterling. Thanks for having me. That's my pleasure entirely. Jo Dr. Jennifer Kirker is also with us. Dr. Kirker completed her medical degree right here at UBC and uh, is uh, following her family medicine residency and emergency medicine fellowship at Dalhousie on the other coast. She sees patients in the urgent care center and is actively involved in family practice and executive health programs at false creek health care center as well dr kirker nice to see you and thank you for making the trek to richmond thanks for having me it's a pleasure so now we know where you come from uh, dr feynman from uh, u of a you're the boss in the urgent care center what's going on these days and what drew you to eight years at false uh, creek health care center well, um, I initially started at Falls Creek eight years ago, and we, we didn't have all of these programs available. I'm, I'm not surprised by that. <laughs> so you've been involved in the evolution of many of these. I, I've been there since the, the beginning of the Urgent Care Center. Okay. And um, so the Urgent Care Center is a private urgent care where we see several different types of presentations of patients from injuries to patients looking for family physicians, and then things have evolved over the years to to start family practice right. um, programs and then a number of wellness and uh, wellness programs as well. Since you've been around for eight years, I imagine in terms of watching a lot of these services come on, uh, come on stream and become available, clearly that would indicate also a growth in staff size at uh, Falls Creek Healthcare Center as well. Yeah, absolutely. We, we have grown and we have, um, we've hired new physicians to, to um, address the, the needs of our growing our growing patient population. Dr. Kirker, how long have you been at Falls Creek? I've been there since uh, 2011. It's been three and a half years. Okay. And what do you do primarily? I went through the, the long list of, because you're both so active and you do so much, what's your main area of focus? So when I first started, it was primarily in the urgent care center. Okay. Um, and since then, I've also started to develop um, a family practice population and um, have been involved in the executive health programs and women's wellness and cardiac protection program as well. There are a lot of programs, and mm -hmm. we're going to try and get through to as many of them as possible, but I'm kind of curious about this urgent care center. Uh, is, what, uh, is, is it similar to what we would recognize as an emergency room in a hospital? Is it that kind of urgent care, people who get in trouble on short notice and they got to go see somebody and you're their people? Is that how it works? Yes, somewhat. Um, it uh, we're yes we're able to see patients who who come in often yeah walking in um, from the street um, right. who have acute um, concerns so something that's developed over a short period of time um, either injuries or you know medical concern like chest pain or breathing problems you know all sorts of different things and um, evaluate them you know as as a physician would in the emergency room um, and then um, you know be able to provide um, investigations, diagnostic right. testing if necessary, and, um, and you know, help them um, determine what's going on and treat them appropriately. Um, there are occasions, um, we, do, we do not um, have ambulances arriving at our door. Okay. Um, but well, that would be the big difference. Yes. Right, okay. Yes. Um, but otherwise, yes, it's, it's, it's relatively similar. Well, you know, I, I'm thinking, Dr. Feynman, people that arrive at, at an emergency situation generally are kind of bashed up and, uh, in many cases, not able to walk home or even take a cab home afterwards. If they require a stay, can Falls Creek accommodate that? We can accommodate that. It depends on the patient presentation. And for various things, obviously, a tertiary care facility is the appropriate um, of course. place for a patient to be managed. Right. So. If we if we see someone who walks in with with chest pain, we're we're able to work it up and stabilize them. But if we are 
actually concerned that this is a a possible heart attack, the best place for them to be would be in a hospital setting. So right. we're we're very quick to transfer and stabilize patients and work with the physicians at the emergency departments, calling them and sending over whatever information um, that we've, we've already obtained about that patient. Other presentations, we do see a number of people, as you mentioned, who are who are bashed up. We see a lot of um, we see a lot of. I try not uh, to get too medical yeah. with my terminology. <laughs> we see a lot of workers' compensation injuries. So a number of people who are injured um, on work sites. Okay. So we yeah. absolutely do see a number of of patients requiring more urgent medical care based on on bone injuries, fractures, um, lacerations strains of multiple joints and you know various presentations so um depending on the particular presentation we generally manage the patient in a in a expedited manner if they need if they require surgery we can often accommodate the surgery within the same day depending on the situation but um typically we we do not have overnight stay patients right. based on our urgent care presentation. But isn't that the, the, the real bonus about Falls Creek Healthcare Center? The fact is that, uh, A, uh, Dr. Kirk, you said a person could come in off the street mm -hmm. in need of urgent care and receive it. And then uh, if, if, for example, some surgical procedure was required fairly immediately, well, there's a staff person, there's this pool of talent available on site that can really uh, expedite uh, the remedies that are required. Yes, so yes, often we do have patients who show up who have a joint injury or a significant laceration that may, we may think that a specialist should become involved and, right. and uh, facilitate their treatment, either surgically or, or in a, me a medical opinion in some cases. And, um, and we often can do that um, same day, you know, yeah, within a very short period of time. Dr. Feynman, how long has the urgent care center been around at Falls Creek? You said you've been there for eight years and witnessed the evolution of the urgent care center, of which you're now the boss. How long has it been up and running? It was founded within within a year of, of when I started working there, so okay. just over just over eight eight years or so, um, and it's evolved over the years to to encompass all of the different presentations with workers' injuries and various things that were not initially the the typical focus. I wanted to talk a little bit about this executive uh, health uh, component to the uh, services provided at False Creek Healthcare Center. What does that mean? What is it, what is an executive uh, program? Does it do I have to be the president of a company to be allowed to participate? How do, how does it work? So no, uh, anyone um, can come in for an executive health assessment. Okay. Um, it really comes down to being a, a very detailed, comprehensive um, kind of physical exam focusing on preventative health measures, trying to um, trying to uh, determine people's risk factors for disease or perhaps some um, conditions that they already have but may not be symptomatic from um, to um, allow them to to get on top of them early and and um, and lead healthier lives moving forward um, so it's a four-hour um, assessment Holy um, smokes, really yeah um, it's it, yeah it's generally booked in in advance it's not something that people typically walk in for we, exactly they, right. they contact you're us. gonna need half a day yeah, yeah there's a bit of planning involved they show up um, first thing in the morning um, having fasted so not having had any breakfast also lots of lab tests involved then, yes right? there's some lab tests involved okay um, and then they go through a series of steps. Um, first, they meet with a, one of our nurses and um, go through, um, you know, they have all their vital signs checked, like their blood pressure, their heart rate, their, th their temperature, things like that. They have their vision checked. Um, they get their height and their weight checked. Um, then they have a detailed multi-organ ultrasound um, performed. Um, that uh, even guys get ultrasound. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, it's uh, right. it's not it's not I, a pregnancy-related well, ultrasound. Well, yes. I, it's, it, I'm sorry, <laughs> I just kind of silly. No, of me, that's I know. okay. But I, I I actually had an ultrasound test on, on I have diabetes, and so I had an ultrasound test on my toes to determine blood circulation. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I they they told me wait we need you you need you to have an ultrasound test, and I thought wait a second I'm not pregnant. Yeah. Yeah. Because for guys, it's not something that occurs generally to us. Right. So what, what, what would the purpose be of the ultrasound? Specifically, what, do you, what would you be looking for so in we, a male patient? Okay, so, um, so both for males and females, ultrasound is very good at looking at different organs in the, in the abdomen. So okay. it's, it's good at assessing kidneys, uh, liver, um, the main blood vessel that runs through your abdomen, your aorta, um, looking for things like aneurysm. Um, it's uh, very good at looking at the carotid arteries to see if there's blockage or narrowing, um, 
you know, evidence of disease there. Um, so there, there are many, many realms, both for males and females, where ultrasound can be quite, uh, quite helpful. And that's part of the package that mm -hmm. takes uh, four hours to, to get through. At the end of that four-hour uh, procedure, and, and you've been through this battery of tests and so on, are you able to present that individual with a, a worked-up assessment of their current health, or is that something that you get, we get back to you a week or so later? Generally, um, patients return a week later okay. and and review all of the results. So, so not only do they undergo ultrasound, they also um, undergo an exercise stress test, uh, looking at at heart status. And Is that where you do the treadmill do, and the yeah. breathing yeah. stuff? Yeah, we okay. have them on the treadmill, and we do extensive blood work, as you mentioned, and they do spend over an hour with a physician, going through a very detailed past medical history, outlining their current medical concerns and um, a comprehensive physical examination as well. So we bring the patient back a week later um, once we've received all of the results from the blood work, from the stress test, from the ultrasound right. and various other tests that, that we may order based on the personal concerns for and, individual patients. And for which results can't be whipped up in an hour or so. Absolutely. You need a few days These in some cases. These things take time. Sure. So, so okay. they come back in when it's it's not as overwhelming having been there for right. a four-hour workup. And, you know, we do feed them along the way, but there's fasting involved. Of and course. And, um, and uh, we sit down with them for about an hour and we go through all of their results and we come up with a plan uh, for ongoing health and for management of any any identified concerns or any pre-existing concerns. You use the word, Dr. Kirker, prevent and I think that's probably going to come up a number of times <laughs> in our conversation because this is what this is what I think uh, a lot more of us boomers are trying to wrap our heads around the fact that it's not you, you don't go to the doctor or a medical practitioner because something is wrong all the time maybe it's smart to go for an assessment or just to try and head them off at the pass kind of thing <laughs> to be in that preventative mindset and give yourself maybe be a, a step ahead of the rest of the crowd, and especially when you're dealing with you know realities like oh I don't know aging and so on. How critical is that preventative mindset, particularly for us boomers? Well, it, it's 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 critical, and that's that is actually why we have designed these programs is because we we understand the importance of preventative health um, in order to help people live longer, healthier lives without having to manage disease after it's been diagnosed. Exactly. We prefer to prevent it before it occurs or at least identify it when patients aren't aware that it already exists and treat it to, in order to prevent further complications of, those, of mm -hmm. those diseases or illnesses. Is it kind of an uphill battle though, getting uh, folks who are, we tend to be reactionary when it comes to medical issues. We don't really go to the doctor or whatever until something's wrong. And you know, that's fine. And that's why, <laughs> thank God there are doctors around. But really how, it, it must be a, a real bit of a chore to try and educate people to really readjust their thinking, retune their thinking to be more aggressive about their health, right? So um, a lot of patients we see, we're, you know, we're, we're quite lucky in that people come in proactively, you know, concerned about their These health. These are the kind of people we're talking we're, about. Yes, that's, right. that's exactly okay. who we're seeing. So right. they, they, they do have those concerns. Um, I think often what becomes more of a challenge is um, putting the necessary steps action steps you know into place so um you know once once we address um certain concerns or or um medical conditions that they may not be aware of yeah, you know okay. high blood pressure being an example or or diabetes um that they might not have symptoms from um there are a lot of um changes that often need to be made even to general lifestyle um you know uh, things they do every day and that i think because people are often fairly set in their day-to-day -day practices and their routines making that step to making those changes is, is often the more difficult thing. One of the things that, uh, because I'm, I'm back to the word executive now, <laughs> and one of the things that working people, particularly with a certain amount of responsibility, deal with on a daily basis is stress, Some, sometimes in enormous doses on a daily basis. What sort of adverse effects on one's overall wellness does a massively stressful job have? Well, stress is an interesting one because 
from a from a physician's perspective, it's not something that we can measure, like blood pressure or your cholesterol true, or yeah. your sugars, That's and true. then say this is what it is and this is how it will affect you. You can in the listen long to run. me complain about what I do all day at work and why I'm so wound up, but you can't measure that, exactly. can you? Exactly. But stress has been has been recognized as a risk factor sure. for for heart disease you and bet. stroke and a number of other conditions, and um, we believe that it actually releases inflammatory processes that can actually result in a heart attack by destabilizing plaque and and causing various problems. So so we do tend to really focus on on the importance of stress and stress management and and um, we we recognize it as a risk factor and, and try to affect change in our patients. And you've mentioned executives. So right. so we, we see we see a number of individuals with um, high stress jobs and um, so we we work quite closely with them, trying to help them uh, cope well with stress and, and reduce their stress and delegate responsibilities. And um, we have not just in our executive health program, but we also have um, other extended healthcare um, uh, allied Options. health, yeah, um, uh, psychologists, sure. for example, right. who who will sit with patients. Again, it's for, the team approach. Exactly. Yes. So for career counseling, for stress management. Um, and and so we definitely we definitely recognize it as important. Well, I think so. And and we're, we're, of course we're going to talk a lot about heart health, uh, and we need to take a break here. But uh, w when we come back, we'll talk more about that. And stress is a, is is can be an enormous factor in one's heart health, can't it? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Our guests from False Creek Healthcare Center in Vancouver, Dr. Lauren Feynman and Dr. Jennifer Kirker. You can find out about them and False Creek Healthcare Center while we take a quick break. Check out falscreekhealthcare.com, and we'll be back after this. Celebrating the baby boomer lifestyle, this is Boomer Life on CL 650. We're back. We're back. This is Boomer Life on CL 650. Welcome back to the program. Sterling Fox with you, joined in studio by Drs. Lauren Feynman and Jennifer Kirker from False Creek Healthcare Center in Vancouver at uh, 555 West 8th Avenue uh, in Vancouver. Now, we're talking about, uh, uh, well, it's February, for crying out loud. <laughs> a, a week from today will be a wash in roses on Valentine's Day. But, of course, it's Heart and Stroke Month nationally in our country. So it's perfect to have you two here to talk about, well, and I'd like to take some time, if you don't mind, both of you to talk about uh, health issues in in health month it's perfectly appropriate i i am in uh, uh, under the impression perhaps mistaken but i am under the impression perhaps i watch too many tv commercials but i'm told by the media that heart uh, disease and heart issues are the number one killer of canadians year after year after year is that true in short, yes. Yes. Okay. So what types of heart issues are the most common and the most problematic? So I think what most people think of when they think about heart disease is, is heart attacks. Yes. Um, there are other conditions that can affect the heart, but that's primarily what um, what's, what affects people that um, on a day-to-day -day basis that, that we think about. And there are lots of um, conditions that can um, increase the risk of developing of having heart attacks or developing heart disease. Okay, now I mentioned heart and stroke months. So Dr. Feynman, what's the difference between a, a stroke and a heart attack? Well, they're actually a very similar process. Both involve a lack of blood flow to a, an area, a, a, an organ system that requires blood flow. So in, in the heart, it's a lack of blood flow to a certain portion of the heart, and that's what causes a heart attack. When the same process occurs in the brain, that's when we call it a stroke. Oh, I and see. And they manifest as, as, as different presentations, obviously. Okay. Is one more debilitating than the other, or are they equally nasty? There's a spectrum in both cases. Okay. So you can have a very small heart attack that... Um, you know, some people don't aren't even aware that they've had a, a, a very small prior heart attack, but um, or you can have a very large heart attack depending on which vessel and where in that vessel um, it it occurs, the blockage occurs and the lack of blood flow occurs um, that can that can be fatal. And similarly with a stroke, uh, depending on where in the brain it occurs and how large that vessel is and how large an area of the brain is affected, you can have very minor symptoms. Um, long-term effects or, or perhaps recover fully or or it can it can lead to death ah i am a reformed smoker 
and uh, quit many years ago. And I was on, on the Internet a couple of days ago, and I came across a chart about what happens to people when they stop smoking and how you can actually physically almost completely turn yourself around. Five years out, your chances of having a heart attack or a serious heart uh, issue are after quitting smoking are then the same as a person who has never smoked. So smoking, by uh, deduction, would therefore be a major contributor to all sorts of heart issues. That's, that's not a, a very uh, dangerous statement to make, right? That's correct. Okay. There, there are a number of, of risk factors that are, um, that are, are recognized as, as risk factors for dis heart disease and stroke. I think a so lot of smoking is one of yeah, them. Yeah, and I think a lot of smokers would be surprised at finding out because you know you sort of get to that point in your life, particularly once you get to sort of boomer status, and, and you're still I want to quit, and you do. But a lot of people sort of, uh, well, I'm too old for any benefit to occur to me now. And that's just not true. If you stop smoking, you can immediately feel benefits. And the longer term benefits are quite rich, aren't they? No, that's absolutely, yes, that's absolutely correct. And that, yeah, it does, it's never too late to quit. We, we tell patients that quite frequently, that you're always going to see health benefits if you, if, you, um, if you can manage to quit or, or at least go through a... Um, like attempt to quit. Often people try many times to quit smoking before they're successful long term and don't don't continue to have those cravings. And this brings us back to your question about preventative health. Yes. These are things that we focus on with patients. So so you're absolutely correct. We don't wait for someone to have a heart attack to say you should be quitting smoking. Right. We we try to And this to, is part of that big workup that you yes. do, the big assessment. Yes, okay. Exactly. And we try to instruct patients about lifestyle modifications in order to prevent disease in the long run and and smoking is definitely a significant risk factor. Well, of course it is. Now, as as uh, at the risk of boring you a little bit even because it's probably as plain as the nose on my face, would you please outline the other major Major contributors to heart disease and heart ill health aside from smoking I would assume obesity is probably way up there on that list too yeah absolutely yes okay what are the others um, diabetes okay high blood pressure high cholesterol and having a family history, like if, if it seems to run in your family, if parents or siblings have had heart attacks or heart disease at early ages, then that suggests that you're probably at higher risk too. So th part of uh, a person's heart problems could not be uh, lifestyle induced or whatever. They could indeed be genetic, something over which you have absolutely no control. That's correct. To a degree, yes. Okay. But it's all the more reason to focus on what they can do lifestyle-wise so to if, alter that risk. Uh, right. So if someone comes to Falls Creek Healthcare Center and sits down for one of these executive assessments, a uh, part of the work up, I'm sure, is, is an extensive uh, discussion about your medical history and your family. Does anybody in your family have heart disease yes. or cancer or any of that sort of thing? And that's when you start to put, to, to connect a few dots, right? Exactly. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we spend quite a bit of time going through, um, yeah, not only the patient's personal uh, medical history, but also reviewing everything related to their family so that we can we can help determine what, what areas we need to work on or what things we need to investigate for further. Okay, so uh, once you've determined, uh, and, and I, I, I don't want to, to get too simplistic, but, you know, it is Heart Month, and we're, we're, we're being exposed to an awful lot of, of information programming by the Heart and Stroke Foundation, by uh, all sorts of, of players uh, in the game, so to speak, and all they want to do is get us to think about our heart health and our general well-being. So, you know, uh, again, we, I, I need you to be really rudimentary with me here and hold my hand and walk me through the steps of better heart health for a boomer who may not be in tip-top physical shape. I know I look like I am, but let's assume that I'm not for a moment. Well, that's a good point. So so we focus on, on things that you can do on your own, such as exercise. So we recommend aerobic activity. Okay. Just getting the heart rate up. It doesn't have to be anything too strenuous, um, but we do recommend a minimum of two and a half hours per week. All right. aerobic activity. And aerobics can be something something as simple as going for a good long walk. That's exactly. correct. Exactly. You, you don't have to get into this, uh, you know, uh, marathon. Uh, no. sorts, and that's what puts a lot of people off. Exactly. And yeah. I don't, I think, you know, we just got through the New Year's resolution stuff. And a lot of people want to look terrific in a bathing suit this summer. Mm. Not a bad resolution. Mm. But what did they do? They went out and they bought a treadmill and tried to run 30 miles in the first two days. And now it's gone. They're, they're done. They're toast. They're, exactly. uh, forget it. Yeah. Because so, we try to do too much too fast. Exactly. And if we've waited, 
50 plus years to finally come to face to face with all of these medical issues and we want to stick around and enjoy life for a few more decades well it is never too late to get smart is it exactly so even 30 minutes of walking a day just at a brisk pace that's my point it yeah. doesn't exactly. have to be expensive or elaborate or contrived put your walking shoes on and if you if you got a dog that's an even better excuse because yeah. you have to do it every day but if you don't go for a walk half an hour a day not a big deal right right exactly okay what else we also we also look at diet so you're looking at things that people can do to stay healthier um, we we counsel patients about healthy diet options um, the Mediterranean diet is an evidence-based diet that's been proven to prevent heart disease, and we, we discuss that extensively with patients, including the, the Mayo Clinic also has a, has a diet that we recommend. Okay. And, and what, what would the essence of the Mediterranean, all I'm, I'm thinking, yes. I've, I've been to the Mediterranean Absolutely. a few times, and I'm thinking of my favorite foods from that yes, area, right. m many of which may not be included in the diet. So what would the essence of, of these recommended diets, what would the, 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 the essence of it be? You want to reduce this, eliminate that, and focus on what? A significant uh, amount of fruit and vegetables, whole grains, fish, olive oils, nuts, Leaner dairy, meats. lean meats, exactly. Yeah, not a lot of processed food, uh, not a lot of refined sugars uh, or trans fats. You just try to yeah, focus on, on whole, whole foods, fruits, vegetables, things like that. Can we talk about salt for a minute? Because I hear, and again, if it's a myth, please help me. But I hear that salt, just uh, a super abundance of sodium, uh, which many of us are guilty of. Let's get the salt shaker, pass the salt. We love salt, and many of us far too much. Is salt, or can salt, be a, a, a health issue? Salt can definitely be a health issue for patients with high blood pressure because it can affect your blood pressure. So for certain patients in, who were, were, were either treating for high blood pressure or monitoring because of borderline blood pressures, we generally recommend salt restriction. Okay. That being said, there is a lot of controversy over what, um, what the optimal amount of salt in our diet per day is, and you'll hear a lot of various um, ranges provided by different associations and I don't think there's a, a lot of strong evidence either way at this point for the average person at, at average risk. Okay, so again, it's what works best for you in yes. your personal profile, and that's what Falls Creek Healthcare Center is all about, just working up that personal profile and giving you a really comprehensive look. And, you know, we're talking about, in, in most cases at least, because I know you see children in your family practice, but in most cases you're talking about grown-ups. And in many cases, I'm sure you're talking to people who have never seen an evaluation of this degree of, of themselves in their lives. That's and I'm sure more than a few of them are a little surprised. <laughs> That's true, yes. Yeah? And what, what are they most surprised at? Um, I think a lot of people are quite surprised just by the depth we can go into with that half-day assessment, okay. essentially. So, um, yes, there are a lot of people that come in that perhaps – um, you know, have not seen their doctor or, or haven't had a doctor for a period of time mm -hmm. um, or, um, you know, reach a certain point in their lives where suddenly they start to worry or think, oh my goodness, I better get my health under control. And they come in with all sorts of questions or uncertainties. And just the fact that we're able to provide them with um, quite a bit of information through the various tests and, and, um, and counseling that we do um, to really help them focus and and move forward. What is the difference between high blood blood pressure and cholesterol problems, high or low, or, or, or are they related, or are we talking two completely different items? Well, um, as you mentioned earlier, both both can be affected um, by by lifestyle, and as well, there there can sometimes be a genetic component for specifically for for cholesterol. Okay, but um. We've identified both of uh, both high blood pressure and high cholesterol as risk factors for heart disease, okay. which yeah. we're discussing sure, today. Sure, yeah, you bet. And often lifestyle can contribute to both of to de the development of both of those conditions. So, patients who are overweight or, or leading sedentary lifestyles um, can be at risk for for both of those conditions. Mm -hmm. Can uh, back to stress for a minute, Dr. Kirker. Can stress be a direct uh, uh, contributor to high blood pressure? Yes, absolutely. And, um, you know, stress itself um, does tend to cause a release of certain hormones like yeah. cortisol, adrenaline that can cause your blood pressure to go up. Um, and then, yeah, over long periods of time, you know, high being 
at a high level of stress um, chronically um, will have a deleterious effect um, on yeah on your on your arteries essentially long term the vascular system. Are the, when you do an assessment like this and you find someone has a low or high blood pressure or a, a cholesterol that's out of the range of, of acceptability and so on, are these adjustments? You, so okay, you need to do this, and here's a diet that we'd like you to try, and and we'd like you to go for a walk once a day for half an hour, and and you have a whole series of constructive suggestions. Uh, when you're in the process of, of providing all of these, are there also at times pharmaceuticals required or do you prefer that individuals attempt to uh, correct the situation minus drugs? Well, it really depends on the situation. In, okay. in some circumstances, medications are, are necessary. Sure. Um, other times when we're identifying high blood pressure or high cholesterol, depending on the levels, we'll often work with patients and give them a, a six-month trial of lifestyle modifications where they'll work on weight loss and dietary changes and exercise, and then we'll follow them up and repeat their, their blood pressure measurements you know, throughout that time period and, and recheck their cholesterol levels and, and see whether or not the lifestyle modifications can actually result in enough of an improvement where we can try to avoid medication management, but there's always a number of medications. Absolutely. The reason I ask is because I saw on, and you may have seen it yourself in the last couple of weeks, one of the local papers, I believe it was the province, had a picture on the front cover of a person sitting in a chair, a very large person, clearly an overweight human being, and the headline went, read, get ready for the pill that can make you thin. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, are people actually going to buy into this where you can uh, just not care care about your lifestyle and you're, you're just going to be able to pop a pill once a month or once a year or whatever and that's just going to fix everything? I don't see that in the cards at all. Dr. Feynman, did you see that headline? And I, what do you make of this stuff? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think everyone would, would love to find an oh, easy we fix all to all of wouldn't our problems. We? But but like I said, it's, it's really about lifestyle management and prevention and leading a healthy lifestyle and having a healthy body weight sure. through exercise, through diet, through healthy healthy choices. Um, I guess I, the reason I, I'm leaning in this direction at all is that we are such a pill-popping society. You got a problem? Ha! We got a pill for it. Well, you know, that's not always the remedy. And, and sometimes, I'm sure, in your professional practices, you've interviewed patients who you didn't give a prescription to at the end of your, of your interview. Oh, for and, sure. And, and the patient went, well, um, don't I get a pill? And you go, no, you don't need a pill. Oh, come on, I do too. Because that's what we're conditioned to. We got a problem, there must be a pill for it. Sometimes, Dr. Feynman, it's not that easy, is it? That's correct. Sometimes there's a little work required. <laughs> that's true. And we just don't really want to take the time, in many cases, Dr. Kirk, to spend on, on doing that. Well, it's kind of demanding to go for a walk for half an hour every day. What if I just take a pill? Yeah, no. Often, often um, it's much easier to provide patients with uh, with the prescription and and just ask them to take a pill a day, but um, but it doesn't lead to the same results. Exactly. And that's one of the luxuries that we have is that because we can take a fair bit of time to counsel patients on on um, you know what their symptoms are, what their risk factors are, it allows us to um, to affect change in their lives without necessarily just going to a pill. Well, this is all part of that rethink that we've been talking about here, trying to get our population to kind of adjust their thinking to a more preventative uh, aspect so that we're, we're, we're trying to be a, ahead of ourselves in, in a sense that we're, we're looking out for ourselves rather than waiting for something to happen and then, then, then well, what happens will kind of thing. So it's, it's a challenge, isn't it? It is. Um, but with that said, we actually are quite fortunate because we have quite a motivated patient population. Mm -hmm. A number of patients who come to us are coming for the wellness programs. They're looking for preventative health and they're actually quite open to implementing the changes and recommendations that are provided following following their investigations. And often they're surprised at some of the findings with, with borderline cholesterol levels mm -hmm. or, or blood pressures or even a body mass index that's higher than recommended that they weren't aware of. So so we actually do have motivated patients. Who... Well, and I suppose the other, the good news part of that, too, is that as more and more people come to be aware of the need to be proactive, to get out there in front of themselves and be uh, their own uh, best advocate, 
we have a, a, a facility like Falls Creek Healthcare Center with a, 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 a whole battalion of professionals there to help that particular mindset. And and more of them, of course, are welcome at all times, right? <laughs> yes, that's true. Our guests in studio, Dr. Lauren Feynman and Dr. Jennifer Kirker from Falls Creek Healthcare Center in Vancouver at 555 West 8th Avenue and online at fallscreekhealthcare.com. And we're back with lots more on Boomer Life after this quick time out. Canada's only weekly radio show dedicated to the baby boomer lifestyle. This is Boomer Life on CIL 650. We're back. This is Boomer Life on CIL 650. Welcome back to the program, Sterling Fox with you. It is February, it is Heart and Stroke Month, and we are very fortunate to have a couple of physicians from Falls Creek Healthcare Center in our Boomer Life studios today. Doctors Lauren Feynman and Jennifer Kirker are with us. We've been talking about, well, all sorts of health and wellness issues, and we've spent a fair bit of time in our last segment about uh, specifically focused in February, why not, on health issues. And there's one thing at Falls Creek Healthcare Center that has uh, is in my notes that I uh, has not come up yet, and I'd really like to find out about the cardiac protection plan. It seems to it's going to flow pretty normally out of, of what you talked about in terms of the assessment, the advice, and that sort of thing, but the specifics, if you will, of the cardiac protection plan. Sure. Well, the cardiac protection plan actually stemmed from our executive health plan, where we had a number of patients spe with specific cardiac concerns or with specific questions about cardiac prevention um, in order to prevent heart disease in the long run. So it's it's um, a comprehensive program similar to the executive health where patients complete a questionnaire prior to coming to the facility okay. with a with very detailed past medical history and family history. And that's reviewed by the physicians prior to their arrival. They come in fasting. They, they see the nurse. They have their vital signs checked. They have a... a, a an hour meeting with the physician where we outline all of their health concerns and do a comprehensive physical examination. Mm -hmm. They have a stress, an exercise stress test on the treadmill, and then they have what we call an echocardiogram, and it's an ultrasound of the heart, looking at the heart's structure and function. They have comprehensive blood work as well, looking for risk factors for heart disease. And then approximately a week or two later, they're seen both by the physician who initially conducted the initial assessment mm -hmm. as well as a cardiologist to review their results. Okay. And uh, is the cardiologist brought in at that point if there are some issues or is it, it perhaps at a point of reassurance if there aren't any problems? Uh, either way, it would be, I suppose, beneficial to the patient, wouldn't it? Exactly. It's a part of our program. So regardless of our findings, um, the patient is seen by the cardiologist at the, at the complete, upon completion of, of the investigations okay. to review the results and, and make a plan going forward for ongoing health. Okay, so this would be, uh, again, as uh, similar to the other four-hour assessment, you're establishing benchmarks here. So as this patient comes back and, and develops a relationship with you and, and your colleagues at False Creek Healthcare Center, there is that initial assessment. And now, okay, so that's where you were six months ago. Let's see how you're doing today. And you have a reference point, and, then, and, and so it becomes an ongoing um, uh, keeping of, of data, right? It can, it can be. I mean, typically the actual program itself is just done, you know, it's that um, snapshot right. um, where, you know, uh, they see us and then um, afterwards, you know, a week later, see our cardiologist and see us again for recommendations and, and potentially, um, so in some cases, they do need long-term follow-up, um, in which case, um, you know, we are happy to continue seeing um, the patients um, or perhaps provide recommendations for them to follow up with their own family doctor or um, continue even being followed by a cardiologist if necessary. Okay, so in many cases, it sounds like you just mentioned your own family doctor. So this can be a supplementary, uh, complementary kind of relationship with one's personal physician and the professional uh, at uh, False Creek Healthcare Center. You are, you're adding on to your, your comprehensive health care package. Absolutely. Yeah. Some, a lot of patients do have family doctors and they come in particularly because they have concerns related to their, their heart or what they think might be their heart, um, you know, breathing um, concerns or chest pain or, or symptoms like that, or just a very high um, risk status if they, you know, have a lot of family members that have had heart disease and they're really worried about their own health. Um, but they, they may have their own um, family doctor already. Yes. Can you have a heart attack and not know it? 
Is there is is that possible? Yes. Okay. I, I and and how would you know? Uh, uh, what 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 are the symptoms? Uh, we're talking to boomers here. So you know these are this our age group is, is certainly more at risk as a as a demographic group mm -hmm. than our kids are. Uh, so uh, what what are we looking for? What sort of uh, clues uh, in terms of awareness, raising our personal awareness? Okay. I think the first thing people think about is chest pain, which is which is typically how a heart attack presents. However, there are a number of associated symptoms as well, such as sweating and nausea, vomiting, shortness of breath, lightheadedness. That Abdominal can, pain. Yeah, absolutely. What is or this pain thing? that's radiating down I was, an arm. Thank or you. To I the was jaw. just going to get to that because uh, I've heard, I, I know people who have had heart attacks, and to a person, they've told me about their left arm. Before, I got this weird tingling, and all of a sudden, I couldn't feel my hand. And uh, so that extremity was uh, an indicator mm -hmm. uh, of some, some real serious stuff going on. Yes. Is, is, that, is that fairly common then? It can, yeah, it is fairly common, especially in some subsets. So women tend to have more um, atypical pain. So, you know, not that classic crushing or chest heaviness okay. that we expect. Um, diabetics often uh, don't have chest pain. Um, and and as we get older, it becomes it often can become a little bit more atypical from that classic presentation. Are men or women more susceptible to heart conditions and heart problems, or is it pretty evenly divided between the genders? I, in terms of stats, I I don't know the exact answer. I think overall you do tend. We're to see equally susceptible. Well, yeah. I mean, I think overall men tend to be susceptible at an earlier age. Okay. Um, but women, once they're postmenopausal, do start to, uh, you start to see more um, issues at that time. With so respect to that. is menopause a player then in terms of elevation of risk levels in women? Dr. Feynman, about, uh, is this, speak to this, would we you? We can. Well, menopause occurs with age. And of course, with age, we see a number of, of possible chronic diseases that are more common as you age. And so... Postmenopausal Regrettably, women I am forced to agree with you. Are at higher risk for for heart disease. Right, right. It's a sad thing being a boomer, you know. <laughs> I mean, aging happens to the best of us, and your turn will come too. <laughs> but it, it's also it, there's there's tremendous comfort to be derived from the fact that it's happening to millions of other people just like it's happening to you. So there's no need to feel isolated. So why do some people go into sort of a cocoon when they, they, they get these, uh, well, I'm getting a little older, you know, and I'm, I'm experiencing more of these health issues that I've never experienced before in my life, so I'm not going to tell anybody about it. What's that about? Yeah. I don't know exactly other than <laughs> I think everyone everyone's aging process is different right. and there there are so many different possible um, you know medical conditions that can crop up as we get older um, and so you know you depending on your your social and family cohort you might um, you know see yourself going through a certain process that you're not seeing your your peers going through um, and and vice versa for them as well. So I think sometimes people don't feel comfortable necessarily discussing their health concerns with their friends and family. Absolutely agree with that. But if you're starting to, to experience these strange new uh, things going on, again, that you've never experienced before, that you have to sort of uh, put up to, uh, uh, well, it's got to be something to do with aging because I've never been this old before. So that's a good time to sit down and uh, have one of those evaluations, isn't it? And nobody needs to know about it except you and your physician, right? Exactly. It's always it's always a good time to to sit down and try to be proactive about your health and and so those particular patients that you are mentioning absolutely would would benefit from, from well, coming in and discussing their specific concerns. And you've spoken, both of you, about the highly motivated patients that you see routinely at False Creek Healthcare Center. These are people who are, I don't want to say aggressively, but certainly energetically uh, being their own best advocates and looking out for their, their wellness. But I guess in terms of, uh, there's a, it's a privacy thing for some people, you know, I don't, I don't share well. But uh, again, when one privately because it always happens to you uh when these these symptoms or these these changes occur that you can't explain that are clearly throwing you off your game that's a good time to sit down with a with a with a medical professional and have a long conversation isn't it 
That's correct. Yes. And things are always kept private between you and your physician. Of so. course. Of yeah. course. And I guess, you know, that's the other benefit that, that really is uh, underscored through all of this. You take your time with people. You have time for people. And if they need to take uh, some extra time to tell you their life story, that's what you're there for. That's true. We do have the luxury of time and we do schedule appointments for, for at least an hour. So, so patients have... A, a significant amount of time to to discuss all of their concerns. Right, and privacy, of course, confidentiality. Yeah, of it course. goes without saying yeah. is is part of the package. Our guests are Dr. Lauren Feynman and Dr. Jennifer Kirker from False Creek Healthcare Center in Vancouver at 555 West Eighth Avenue, up there on the sixth floor. Online at FalseCreekHealthcare.com, and we're back with more on Boomer Life after this. Canada's only weekly radio show dedicated to the baby boomer lifestyle. This is Boomer Life on CIL 650. We're back. We're back. This is Boomer Life on CIL 650. Welcome back to the program. I'm Sterling Fox. It is Heart and Stroke Month across Canada. And on our show today, we have a couple of physicians from Falls Creek Healthcare Center in Vancouver to walk us through a lot of questions about heart and stroke and all sorts of wellness issues. Our guests are Dr. Lauren Feynman and Dr. Jennifer Kirker from Falls Creek Healthcare Center. You'll find you do a lot of family practice work and you have a, a colleague in there as well, a South African physician as well. And uh, his name is... Dr. Jan Venter. Okay, and so the three of you, this is your uh, corner of, of the uh, False Creek Healthcare Center. So what, uh, when you have a family practice, uh, I, I, I asked earlier, do you see children? And you said yes. Um, uh, do you see a lot of children? And do you see children as part of seeing a whole family rather than just a child being brought to you uh, specifically? So... Occasionally in our urgent care center, we will have a child brought in specifically. That would, that would make sense. Yeah, sure, that, right. that does happen occasionally. But typically, most of the children we do see are through our family practice program. And it's because, yes, their parents are also part of the program. Um, and so, yeah, there's a small subset within our practice that is, is children. Um, uh, but, yeah, they, they generally come. We see siblings. We see them from, you know, from birth right through uh, teen years and then, and then as adults. So that uh, kind of spins out of the wellness program, the women's uh, wellness program, then, doesn't it, Dr. Feynman? If you're seeing mom and then mom has a baby, well, then chances are that that little person is going to be included uh, in some visits uh, along the way. So you actually, uh, in the women's wellness program, deal with women. We've talked a bit about menopause, for example, on the program as it relates to heart issues and so on. But you actually... Uh, have a focused program for women of all ages. That's correct. We see women through all of their reproductive stages and at all ages. And 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 you're correct. We do see families growing as well. We see women through their pregnancies, and we also see their their newborn children and their and their growing children and the family as a whole. I imagine that must be a fun part of practice. It is. It's one of the best parts I can of well family practice. And I'm, I'm a hockey fan, so I have to ask you about the Canucks because I understand in the executive uh, portion of the program, the Canucks are are our clients. They are actually over the last year we've we've partnered with the Canucks and we're their preferred supplier for executive health for the Canucks executive team. Oh, okay. So we have had a number of the the Canucks executives uh, coming through over the past year. We've gotten to know them very well. It's been it's been a great partnership. I'll bet it has. And uh, any free tickets? No, no, no. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. So uh, talk to us a little bit about in the final few moments of our program. We are being trying very hard to be heart health aware uh, on this uh, first weekend of February. Uh, um, and, and we talked about clues or, or, or uh, indicators that, uh, that people should be really sensitive to in terms of, well, I got a problem here and I, this is a recurring symptom or it could be. When you start experiencing this in your life and, and you start seeing repetitive patterns of weirdness, this is a good time to, to consult a medical professional, right? Yes, certainly. If you have any any concerns um, that you're experiencing new symptoms, um, you know, any anywhere really in your body, but but certainly if you're concerned about about your heart, then it, it's a, a good time to book an appointment to see your family doctor or come in and see us, or you know, in an urgent case, obviously, um, you know, head straight to the urgent care or to an emergency department. Right, and but when the assessment is done, and we talked a little bit about this earlier. And once there's been a profile worked up, and okay, you do have some issues here. You need you need to lose 15 pounds. You need to adjust your diet. You need to do a, a few smart, practical things. The, I, I guess the big trick 
is, is to ease into any remedial situation rather than jump into, a, into the deep end of the pool with both feet, right? Exactly. Because uh, then you're just going to hurt yourself and you're going to walk away from it, right? It's easier to implement change through, through slow, gradual steps. And um, so we, we always give recommendations to start slowly, not to do anything you, you don't enjoy when it comes to exercise. And then gradually you'll notice an improvement in your endurance levels and your exercise capacity, and then things can evolve from there. Okay, and uh, as one improves, do, can, can you actually, if you are found to have, for example, high blood pressure, and you said earlier, Dr. Feynman, that in some cases, medications are the appropriate uh, solution or uh, part of the appropriate solution. Is it possible when, uh, when diagnosed with high blood pressure or some other high risk condition that you can, through a series of, of medications and, and exercises and some program, can you cure that condition or make it so much better that it's, it's totally managed? Yes, absolutely. You can, you can reverse a lot of um, a lot of changes, including blood pressure, cholesterol, things like that, with with exercise, with dietary changes, with weight loss, uh, I, with quitting smoking. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, I hesitate to use the word cure because it, it's it, it's too easy. But yeah. what I'm talking about is significant improvement to the point where you hardly recognize yourself from that person you were a year ago. That's mm -hmm. correct. That's doable, isn't it? Absolutely. Okay, and it all it takes is uh, I would think a fairly high you're talking about highly motivated people that you like to see when they mm -hmm. come down but that's what it's going to take it's going to take a a, a certain degree of determination to uh, once well if you're as concerned as you are and when you go down and and go through the procedures at false creek Healthcare center clearly you are a determined person and it's going to take a whole lot more of that if you have a problem and need to get past it you need to be very focused don't you yeah, absolutely. And if you need any help or guidance along the way, we we are happy to see people for follow up. We're happy to 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 check in and see um, how reassess how how they're doing with their lifestyle modifications and weight loss and various different um, health concerns. And we have dietitians that can help with diet planning and weight loss and and we sort of look at the whole picture. Well, what you have is an absolutely massive support group, don't you? I mean, you have this team of incredibly talented, accomplished professionals who can just, um, who can step in and be of constructive uh, assistance in any area of one's wellness. Yes. That's quite remarkable. Yeah, yeah, I know it is quite remarkable. It's quite a place. <laughs> False Creek Healthcare Center is in Vancouver, and not just on the sixth floor either, I am reliably formed. It's all over 555 West 8th Avenue, and the website is falsecreekhealthcare.com. Check it out. My thanks to Dr. Lauren Feynman and Dr. Jennifer Kirker. Thank you both for coming down. A pleasure to meet you both. Thanks for Please having us. Please come back. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Stanley. Have a great day. Catch up to you next time here on Boomer Life.